Welcome to the Upland Nation podcast. Scott Linden here on our weekly adventure into the great outdoors, playing with dogs, enjoying the fellowship of another hunter or two or 10, if you're in South Dakota, and all the beautiful places we get to go. In fact, we're going to talk about all of those today. We'll take a pheasant hunting tutorial from my good friend and pro guide, Al Gadori. He's going to take us to Montana and tell us how to do it step by step the whole way through from scouting to shooting. Al's the guy to take you to school and once again me because I went on an athletic scholarship the first time. Oh boy. On top of that though, we'll be talking to you about what you shoot at the most. Just curious to know who chases what kind of birds and I'll share that with you. And then, uh, well, speaking of Montana, among other places, because that's just one on the list, I will give you some sharp-tailed grouse starting points if you're headed for somewhere in the, I guess I'll call it the upper Midwest, uh, for that iconic bird. I called it America's bird in a magazine article, and it's absolutely true. The entire Upland Nation podcast is made possible by all these great sponsors. Please patronize them and tell them I sent you. Hi-Viz Shooting Systems, Purina Pro Plan Sport, MidwayUSA.com, True Lock Choke Tubes, Mid Valley Clays and Shooting School, Pointer Shotguns, and Sage and Breaker Gun Care Products. Hot here. There too. Yeah, smoke, among other things, from the wildfires, but still having a great time and working hard on my shooting these days. Got to shoot with, well, a good friend who started out as um, our veterinarian five wire hairs ago. Yeah, met him within weeks. Well, within weeks of moving here and within hours of picking up my first puppy, Bill. Lanny and I go back a long way. He's done a lot of good for me over the years, and I sure appreciate it. And so we finally finally got to shoot some sporting clays together. It was a lot of fun. Uh, If you can't go into the field, you can go to the range and do the same thing, or at least a lot of the same things. And that was the fun part, the fellowship, the camaraderie. I did uh, practice a couple things that I want to share with you because I'm convinced now Most of the time when we shoot, we need to slow down. Yeah, take longer to focus on the bird. Slow down that gun mount so it's correct. And then speed up. The moment that face hits that gun stock, pull the trigger. Every time I did that, I hit the target. Every time I didn't do that, I missed the target. Well, there's my lesson for today in the shooting world. Uh, Thank you again to everybody at Mid-Valley Clays and Shooting School for drumming that into my head yet again. Uh, You, it's that time of year. We're all looking kind of like, you know, the night before Christmas. That'd be a fun project to, to adapt that story to the night before opening day but um i was very curious and and i've asked this before but uh, this time of year you're really tuned into it and so i asked again what bird species do you hunt most often not surprisingly 46 percent of you said ringneck pheasants i was a little surprised at the number two bird on the list uh, quail with 22 percent of you uh lucky enough to find quail ground go for it i man i i'm lucky in many ways they're valley quail out here third on the list the third most popular uh bird to uh hunt rough grouse with 15 percent of you then it drops down from there four percent are on chuckers let's see sharp-tailed grouse is about three percent uh huns about two percent uh sage grouse 0.7 percent and other forest grouse about one and a half percent uh yeah okay almost five percent of you also list woodcock as your most often hunted bird yeah insights on what other guys are doing and what you may be doing as well it's all there if you don't take the surveys at the upland nation insights newsletter i'm going to start putting some of those on the social media as well but please do sign up for that at find bird hunting 
Spots.com. And we are brought to you in part by Mid Valley Clays and Shooting School. These are hunters who are teaching us how to shoot in the field or on the range. They also have shotguns for both applications, uh, no matter what you're looking for in that world, including sub gauges. 2028 410 always in stock. And remember, until September 30th, up to 75 bucks off a new Browning shotgun. They got a rebate program going on right now. On all their guns, Satori's, Maxis, BPS, call and ask for details, midvalleyclays.com. Yes, okay. And also, we are brought to you by Purina Pro Plan Sport. You know, I've uh, made the switch, and Flick is, um, he is full of energy. He's got the right stuff flowing through his veins, and it's all because it's the right stuff that's in Purina Pro Plan Sport. You want to learn more about all their formulations, full range, no matter what age your dog is, no matter what condition that dog is in, go to ProPlansport.com. ProPlansport.com. i got to practice saying that a little bit more. You can help fuel performance no matter what stage your dog is at. Take a look at the ingredients, see if you don't agree. And as we get into the season, I'll be giving you a full report on how Flick is doing on Pro Plan Sport. Learn more at ProPlansport.com. Yeah, I can't wait to see him. Yeah, I'm headed to Lewistown, Montana uh, in September. So uh, Al Godori will be there. Al is with 6xoutfitters.com. Al is the guy who has shown us the magic world of Montana sharp tails, Hungarian partridge, and pheasants over the years. Al is a pro guide who knows his stuff. Al, welcome to the Upland Nation podcast. Well, thank you for having me. It's great to catch up again uh, and looking forward to having a beer or two with you when I get there. In the meanwhile, you have been a busy guy. Um, sharp tail season is just about here. You are, um, you know, people people don't realize how much work a pro guide does before they show up for the glory part of the transaction. What have you been doing the last few weeks? Well, I've been going out right after sun sunrise and try to get a couple hours in uh, getting my dogs in shape and getting a line on what the birds are doing this year every year seems to be different uh this year the cover is thicker than it's been in many years and taller than it's been so when i've been when i was looking at the uh high benches where i usually find birds uh this time of year I wasn't finding anything. I'll be uh, darned. A, a lot of the cover was too tall and too thick. The grass was, you know, waist high. And sharp tails don't like that. Uh, they don't like it any taller than knee high. They like to look around, see what's going on. Uh, you know, they might, they might roost in tall cover, but uh, they don't want to feed in it. Uh, they don't want to spend the day in it. You know, it's fascinating because I've never heard that problem in sharptail country before. Have you ever seen it until this season? Yes. Uh, usually it's pretty dry. Usually it's uh, I can look at about half the properties and, and they're not going to hold any birds because there's not enough cover. Yeah. yeah. But the hay fields, uh, they're coming in real thick. Uh, the wheat fields, farmers are getting... 50 to 80 bushels per acre now wow. and in a normal year they get uh 20 to 30 dry land in a good year wow this this year is exceptional a lot of uh, new a lot of new pickup trucks going to be driving around uh, montana this year yes it will be wow so all right so back to the and by the way everybody we will talk pheasants and uh how to if you want to call it that in a moment but i'm being a little selfish here because i'll be out there in a few weeks um al where where do you look when, when the cover is that tall where do you look for sharpies 
you just have to find some cover that's not a stall. Okay. Uh, what, right. I, what I found uh, this year is there's a lot of grasshoppers. There's a, a plague of grasshoppers, but there's, you know, so much cover, it's it's not a problem for the rancher. They're not eating everything in sight. Yeah. I've been I've been finding the sharp tails uh, in alfalfa that's about a foot tall or less and near creek bottoms, if you can find a hay field where uh-huh. it's uh, knee high. And they're they're feeding on the hoppers. They're not moving around much, and the coveys are bigger than I've seen in in many years. Uh, so they've they've had a good hatch, and I don't think the predators are getting many of them because they just can't see them. Yeah, and and like you said, there's a lot of protein out there. And you know, you, you were the one who pointed out years ago that given the choice, sharp tails of all ages will eat grasshoppers over just about anything else. Yes, and, and the Huns also. Oh. And I think the pheasants do too, but by the time pheasant season opens, they're, they're switching over to grain because there's, there's not many hoppers around in, you know, mid-October. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's leave that since this is not about me. This podcast is about everybody on the other end of the transaction. I do want to talk about your young dog first, and then we're going to jump into pheasant hunting uh, 101 through graduate level pheasant hunting. How's the young dog doing? Well, Rip is uh, eight months old now. Seems to be doing everything right. Uh, I've been getting some beautiful points with her on birds. I'm also getting some very nice points on butterflies. <laughs> and mice yeah and uh, occasional hawk but uh, she's she's coming around she's just got to explore everything yeah you know. uh, what what kind of just give us a perspective here you've been around the block a few times by the way is um um tell everybody what kind of dog she is and, and where she's come from and all that oh she's an english setter and uh, comes from a field trial line of of grouse dogs uh you know, medium-sized dog, uh, f- fairly tall, very fast. Yeah. Kind of like all your other dogs, except the Labradors. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love it. They're beautiful in the field. I, in fact, I was just re-watching an, an old episode for a bunch of reasons, and I remember, oh, a lot of that kind of stuff. But um, but anyway, what what are your expectations for Rip this first bird season? What what do you expect? What do you what are you going to do with her and what do you expect her to do? Well, I'll, I'll give her a lot of opportunities to hunt. Uh, she's been very solid on points. Uh, she does like to chase birds and we're going to have to discourage that. Um, she does like to retrieve, but she's also taking long victory laps with the bird. <laughs> so we'll have to rein that in. Uh-huh. But uh, I'm I'm going to give her a lot of experience uh, yeah. this year. You know, they say, uh, you know, uh, the, the birds can train the dog. But uh, both of those aspects you just mentioned, uh, you have a hand in those as well. What what are you going to do, for example, on the, uh, on the, um, the uh, I guess I'll call it the retrieving end of things? Are you going to train her while she's out there or are you working on that in advance? No, I'm not going to train while I'm hunting. Yeah. Uh, you just it's just too difficult uh to do there's too many variables you can't control the situation yeah uh you know i'm gonna let her hunt and i i get what i get uh if she's a problem she just goes back in her kennel for a while to think about it i've got plenty of other dogs yeah you know, yeah that can hunt but she's going to get an opportunity every day and you're such an incredible shooter um do you forego the shots when she doesn't when a when a dog doesn't do what you you expect them to do at that age when i'm training i would not shoot Uh uh-huh when i'm hunting i I can't tell my clients you know don't shoot because the dog didn't behave they're not out there to train my dog so (laughs) so they they shoot and you know we get what we get (laughs) yeah 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 we should make them sign a disclaimer i remember the first time i helped out on a on a guide job and and i said listen my dog is is not bad but he's not great but uh you know so if you want to go with that guy instead go ahead and they chose not to and luckily we got we did all right 
Anyway, enough about the young dog. Let's talk about my favorite subject, and that is pheasant hunting. Um, yeah, you know, it's funny. I think about it. The, the, we've we've only hunted pheasants uh, maybe two or three times together, and, and, and usually as part of a triple, we did a lot of other things as well. But pheasant hunting in Montana is becoming more and more, um, I guess I'll call it, well-known. Um, and, and there are a lot of reasons for that. Um, but, uh, let's start at the beginning and see how far we can get. If you were going to be hunting pheasants, uh, right at the opening, uh, close end of the season, which mid October, I think for you guys too. Um, yeah. What, what would you do in advance of actually setting foot in the field, uh, to prepare, to find the places that you think would make the most sense? Well, talking to the landowner helps a lot. They they notice pheasants. They don't seem to pay much attention to sharp tails or, or huns, but yeah. uh, you know they they like their pheasants. Uh, that helps a lot. I I don't do any scouting with the dogs for pheasants because uh, this time of year my dogs will catch too many of them, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, I don't like to see that. No, nobody does, especially the guys at the Department of Fish and Game. Um, yeah, well, they put the brakes on uh, training dogs recently in Montana. Yeah. Uh, you can only train your dogs on wild birds uh, on public land during the month of, uh, you know, starting August 1st, you know, through the end of March. Yeah, and uh, and, and now you got to buy a permit of some sort, too. Yes, it's five dollars for a resident and ten dollars for a non-resident, so that that's not a big issue. But you better have it. Yeah, uh, yeah. I remember. You know what they're what they're trying to stop is professional trainers coming out in June and July with you know big strings of dogs and running them on wild birds that just aren't mature enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it makes all the sense in the world, and uh, I remember going through that. Even here in Oregon, we had to uh, basically rewrite the law on that whole situation a while back. Uh, not pretty, but we we actually accomplished something. All right, so so you're you're what are you looking for then? If if you're not out with a dog, you're talking to the landowners, uh, and and what else in the way of habitat do you think makes the most sense for most of us when we're hunting out there? Well, in Montana, uh, if you're going to find a lot of pheasants, it's going to they're going to have to have some type of grain crop ah. and also near water you know grain and cover uh, that's those are the two main things to look for okay so now you got me intrigued because i had this discussion in south dakota a couple years back w- what's the water doing are they coming down to drink it or is it just creating better cover i think it's creating uh holding cover for yeah. them yeah I, I don't I don't know if they need it to drink. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, but they they do need the grain, and uh, you need you need both of those things, you know, to find pheasants and where I hunt, anyways, in Montana. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we got some habitat criteria. We've made friends with a landowner or two who says go that way instead of that way, and and maybe he'll even get more specific. We never know. Um, yeah. Uh, edges are a big deal. Uh, I mean, are the, are Montana pheasants hanging uh, right at the margin of a grain field uh, and something else, or is it right on the riparian zone when there's water available, or, or are they close to it? What what kind of where do they frequently hang? I think all the birds like edge cover. Yeah. So that that would be the first place I would go, and it, you know it's easy to see pheasant tracks if there's any uh, you know dusty roads or, or mud around. Uh, of course, they're easy in the snow, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. but that's that's what I look for. And and when you're hunting that, um, are you uh, are you actually sending your dog basically back and forth between the two? habitat types are you going into one or out of the other how does what kind of strategy do you use for that well when i'm I'm hunting a pointing dog it's usually uh in an alfalfa field or taller stubble Mm -hmm. and 
I just I want to hunt a dog that's not going to be more than a hundred yards away in that yeah. situation. Uh, I just leave him alone and let him hunt. I don't try to direct him. Yeah. Uh, an experienced dog should know where to hunt. Uh, try to be quiet. You don't need to whistle. If the dog points, you don't need to yell "whoa" unless he moves. <laughs> I, I see that a lot. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, the sound of your voice, I think, scares the birds worse than than anything else. Uh, they they don't hear people talking out there very often, and yeah. uh, boy, they'll be running if if you're making noise. Yeah. In fact, I remember uh, the, the first revelation I had like that. It was long ago on some chuckers, and and I have since. Uh, in fact, I need to write a story about all the other ways you can use a good electronic collar, including directing your dog. And I don't mean with the shock, but with all the other more quiet stuff. Um, how do you? Yeah. Uh, if I'm hunting, if I'm hunting with the uh, the flushing dogs. Uh, my only concern is they stay in gun range. Yeah. And a mistake I see people making a lot is their flushing dog will get on a hot track. Mm. They'll they'll want to call him all the way back in. in uh, instead of that's what? hard to do. Yeah. <laughs> instead of just instead of just stopping him. Yeah. Just stop him. Walk up to him. Let him go again. Because uh, yeah. they don't want to come back in when they're on a hot track. And and if they do they're going to go right back to where they left off very quickly. It's, it's, they'll make up the lost ground in a, in a flash. Right, right. And then you'll be back where you started. And, and they'll have more momentum, too. <laughs> oh, yeah. They'll be determined to, to get that bird this time. You know, but that's got, you know, that's got to be hard. And I remember we, we ran into that a lot in, in some of the more open cover a few times. And you'd have your uh, Labradors, you'd have them sit. Yeah. That's, that's the command you to... use. Yeah, they sit on the whistle. Yeah. Uh, you know, the pointing dogs, they should know how close they can get to a bird before they bump them. Uh, that, that comes with experience. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and every day's different, too. Uh, you know, some days the birds are just jumpy and, and they're hard to handle. Yeah, yeah. Uh, those are the days I'm out there. Uh, yeah. You're listening to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden. That's Pro Guide Al Gadori, six letter X outfitters.com learn more about what he's doing and how you might be able to work with him uh, i cannot wait to get back out there only wish i could come out again for pheasant season but hey once a year is better than no times a year um how do you train your flushing dogs to get to that point where they'll sit on the whistle i mean it i i'm going to say it's just like using the woe command and i know that's different than pointing but do you just make it an obedience command and work it on the table, in the yard, et cetera, et cetera, or do you have a magic wand that you just wave? No, I start as soon as I get a puppy. Yeah. Uh, and nothing good is going to happen until that dog sits when I blow the whistle. He has to sit before I feed him. He has to sit before he gets in his kennel or goes in and out of the house. Uh, it, it starts there. And then... Uh, I train a lot with pigeons. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we have a big dog club in Bozeman. We've got uh, 150 members, and I train with the Pointer Group and the Spaniel Group and and the Labrador Group. And so they're they're on birds all year. Yeah. And you know, they learn by repetition. And you know, once they understand the command, you you can reinforce it with an electronic collar. Uh, you know, my older lab Bigfoot that that you know. Yes. Uh, I can turn, I never have that collar set higher than 35 for that dog. She will, she will sit. Uh, I got a young one, two year old Pollywog. I turned that collar up to 135 to get her attention. <laughs> I didn't know they went that high. <laughs> it's, it, they don't go any higher. <laughs> that dog is just tough. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, you know, she's a hard head. But she's good at what she does. Yeah. Uh, but but that will stop her, you know, reluctantly. Uh, it it, it the dogs are all different. You know? Yeah, and and you alluded to the. I mean, let's 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 put things back in proportion. Uh, as you said, only good. The only time good things happen is when they follow the rules. So yeah. so there's that. Uh, yes, there is an aversive side to training, but the primary 
side is more, um, I guess I'll just call it positive reinforcement. Yeah, and snacks help a lot, too. You know, if you have trouble with a dog coming when he's called, yeah. you start giving them a small biscuit every time they come in, uh, you know, it, it changes their attitude. Oh, doesn't it, though? I, I just did a, a, a brief moment on this. Uh, I, I never thought two and two would end up being five, but... Flick is a great retriever, but he gets so, you know, wire hairs. They're so psyched up when they finally get a retrieve. He brings it back, and, and there's always one crunch right before he hands it over. Yeah. Uh, except now that he's getting Costco chicken skin on the retrieve, he's soft-mouthed. Well, so <laughs> whatever works, you know? Yes. Yes, well, I had trouble with my young setter coming in, uh, and the, the past two weeks I've started with a small biscuit every yeah. time I call her. Yeah, and boy, she comes running now. Yeah, isn't that the truth? It's it, yeah. A lot of people argue against food rewards, and granted, you know, you don't want to carry a bag of groceries with you on, on in the field, but but as a training tool, I think they get short shrift by a lot of the you know the folks who are a little bit more old school. Yeah. And she doesn't get a treat every time. Yeah, there you she go. Never, she never knows. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm glad it works for you. Not that you need any help on that, but uh, good on you. What about your pointing dogs? How do you steady them better? Uh, uh, granted, it doesn't happen in the field first. It happens at uh, at your club in Bozeman. And, and what, you're, what are you doing early on, say with Rip, to get her to stay more steady? Well, that particular pup i haven't had a problem with her Once okay she points she does not move yeah but i've i've set the training birds up in a remote release trap yeah. and i plant them in thick cover so there's no way she sees that bird yeah. when she points yep. and uh i can walk up to her put a leash on her and then i just uh before i release the bird i, I put my hand on her back and, and push on her and she pushes back yeah, and, so you're pushing and, forward, so she pushes back away from the bird. Right. Yeah. Right. You know, uh, and then release the bird, and we've been shooting birds over her, and, you know, I, I make her wait a few seconds before I release her to retrieve, and she she retrieves and marks like a setter. You know, she she might stop 10 yards short of the bird and start running around or go beyond it 50 yards and then work her way back uh they don't mark well yeah well uh <clears throat> they mark better than the wire hair in our kennel today <laughs> i don't know about oh, that there's God. a reason i have laps that heal yeah <laughs> yeah and believe me we've had a lot of that i'll tell you one funny thing that happened it's happened like three times in the last two weeks you know i'll put out fully fledged hard flying pigeons and then i'll put out a wing clip bird so that it'll fly a little because i don't have a shooter to help me most of the time so that bird will fly a little bit and then land and we can pretend it's been shot and uh, and flick will go out and get it uh so the, so the the wing clips have been flying away and the hard flyers have been landing too short uh but what it's been doing is teaching flick that if you don't get if if when i say fetch if you don't move and get on that bird and know where it is immediately it's going to get away and and i i don't know if that's such a good thing or not but it seems to be paying off for him <laughs> maybe with your spaniels you know you run into spaniel trainers who will use variations on that strategy have you ever tried that no, the spaniel trainers uh, that I work with, uh, they'll send their dog on a line. They don't take a line very well. Yeah. And they get in the general area of the bird, and they just run around until they find it. They're very yeah. thorough. Yeah. They just yeah. keep going and going and going until they find it. Where with the Labradors, uh, I want to stop them and handle them and put him right on the bird. Uh huh. But particularly with pheasants, you never know if a pheasant's dead until you have it in your hand. Yes, and even uh, then they'll jump out of the vest about every fourth time. Well, <laughs> I've been, I've been, I've cut my hands uh, on dead pheasants too, just oh, by wow. being careless handling. Yeah. I mean, with those 
old long spurs. Yeah. But uh, one thing I see people do a lot is they'll shoot a bird. You know, I'll ask him, is it dead? Yes, it's dead. Are you sure? Yes, it's dead. I killed it. Okay. But your dog ran over to it, and then he took off. I said, well, just give him some time. Let's go over and look for it. No, just stand there and wait. If the bird's dead, it's not going anywhere. Uh, If the dog took off, he's probably trailing a wounded bird. And almost all the time, the dog comes back with a wounded pheasant. Yeah, so, yeah, and I remember actually doing this with you once on, on a little break that went down to a, a a stream of some sort, I think, on Huns or something. But Yeah. But it was, it, it, like you said, don't go in there and help the dog. They, they, no, they're way better at it than us. Yes, and if, if you go in there, you know, the dogs are trained to hunt in front of you. Uh, they're gonna, they, You may push them away from that bird. And then if you see it, you're not going to be able to catch it. You're too slow. <laughs> you, you, know? you should have seen me yesterday. <laughs> yeah. Well, every time I've I've twisted an ankle or got hurt, it's been from chasing a wounded bird. I, d- I don't do that anymore. <laughs> well, there's the lesson in it right there. Oh, boy. Yeah. Well, we, we've got a lot more to talk about. Uh, more pheasant hunting stuff, including what to do after the point uh, and how that all works. Uh, maybe we can get you to talk a little bit about your uh, experience gunning for spaniel trials. I'm intrigued by all of that. It's all coming up right here on the Upland Nation podcast. And then I will touch on some of the starting points for sharp-tailed grouse in the upper Midwest. It's all coming up right after a couple messages. Al, I'll be right back to you. And in the meanwhile, check out MidwayUSA.com. You know, they carry just about everything for shooting, hunting, and the outdoors. Yeah, I just got a new headlamp. Yeah, they got all sorts of camping and, and, you know, related stuff. So my shopping list at Midway just gets longer and longer, and yours too. And now the good news is sign up for their emails or text messages, and you'll get 10% off your next order. So so make a long list. Go to MidwayUSA.com. Get 10% off the whole list just by signing up for their email or text messaging notification program. MidwayUSA.com. And if you need a little bit more shooting help, and who doesn't, HiViz Sites might be another place for you to go. H-I-V-I-Z Sites.com. They say, see what you've been missing. And boy, it's starting to help me. You know, I, I don't aim. Yeah, I've gotten that far. But I am cross-dominant, and I, you know, I got enough problems shooting. So what I found is that one of their simple-to-install magnetic fiber optic sites helps me create a subtle subconscious relationship between the muzzle and the target now with luck that'll pay off in more birds in the bag this season i'll keep you posted on it but in the meanwhile high vis sites has already solved problems for people who buy major brand shotguns like ruger smith and wesson benelli browning and remington Find out what those manufacturers know. Take a look at HighVizSites.com. And speaking of shooting, Al Godori, 6XOutfitters.com. How was your scouting today, by the way? It was excellent. I I found... uh... You know, a couple of coveys of Huns. Oh, yeah. A uh, cu- couple big coveys of sharp tails. Uh, things look really good. Now, when it's this warm and dry, you don't see fancy dog work. <laughs> uh, you know, a lot of the birds are going to get bumped with the pointing dog. They, they can find them, but they, they just can't handle them because usually there's no wind in the morning. Yeah. And uh, by the time they they know the birds are there, they're right in the middle of them. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, so so your expectations are relatively low in terms of dog work right now, and I I understand that yes. completely. Yes. All I want to do is go into an area and find out if, if there's one good cover of birds there, and once I know that, uh, I'm not going to go back in there till I'm ready to hunt that area because if I can find that one covey. Birds will lead to other birds. 
<laughs> um, you know, I don't, I don't want them nervous the next time I find them. Yeah, I've heard this with elk hunters and chucker hunters. Uh, don't leave elk to find elk. Yes, I, I saw 35 elk this morning, too. Wow. Uh, down in an alfalfa field right in the creek bottom. Oh, I bet that was lovely for the rancher. <laughs> well, I, ju- I just backed away from him because he's a bow hunter, and that, that opens soon, and oh, I, yeah. I didn't want to I didn't want to push him off his ranch. Oh, heck no. I love that. Well, good on you. Let's get back to pheasants and pheasant hunting because, um, you, you know, I, every time I show up, in your vicinity i learned something from you but we've never really talked about it as much as we could let's we got a dog it, it's a it's a pointing breed of one sort or another and we're out in a vast prairie what do we do once the dog starts getting birdie what can we do to help that dog and then what do we do right after that point what i see a lot of people do when the dog gets birdie, they freeze <laughs> and stand there waiting for him to point. Well, that doesn't work very well with pheasants because, uh, you know, they're, they're tough for a dog to handle. Yeah. Uh, move towards the dog and don't say a word. Uh, and when the dog points, don't yell point. You know, no, you don't need to tell me the dog's on point. I'm paying attention. I'll see it. Uh, and if and if you're not paying attention, well, I can't help you. Because uh, when you speak, a lot of times that bird will flush. Yeah. Or or at least he knows exactly where you are. Uh, those birds know where the dog is, and they don't need to know where you are till it's too late. Yeah, I love that idea, and uh, and and so many people are just the opposite. We've all learned that. You know, I I trained myself pretty well a few years ago. When I said that word W H O A, I always yeah. I always stopped walking. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to get trying to break it, but but uh, the uh, flick won't turn the collar up high enough to get me to change my behavior yet. Yeah, and quite often there, you know, there'll be a group of pheasants uh, that the dogs work in. You don't have to yell hen when a hen gets up. Uh, it's not hard to tell a rooster from a hen. And uh, just be quiet and keep moving. Uh, it's probably not the only bird there. Well, there you go. In fact, that is fascinating information. And I've had it, you know, that experience a few times, nowhere near as many, because somebody's always yelling rooster. You don't need to yell rooster either. Just shoot it. Yeah, well, that would scare the bird too, but, but at, yeah, least, well, at least you'll get a shot. It'll be the last time he's scared. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, some of that country is really big, and even if it's not really big, it's big enough to where we know they're going to you know, somehow a lot of those roosters are going to run as fast as they can away from whatever they're in fear of. Have you ever in a you know kind of a montana slash prairie pheasant hunting situation have you ever thought about putting a blocker anywhere do you ever use a you know a strategic uh, blocker if you want to call it that in a in a small scale situation yes uh you know when i've got a group of three people i'm guiding i i don't guide more than three uh quite often i'll put a blocker at the end of the cover yeah but i'll, I'll have him hidden Ah. Uh, you know, take the orange off and uh, get down, get down low behind some brush. And then when you see the under, other hunters coming, when they're within 100 yards, you step out so they can see you. OK. Uh, and then, you know, you've got the birds between you. Someone's going to get a shot. So uh, what, hunting, what... hunting alone, I've, I've also, you know, put up a, you know, a vest with a hat on it as a scarecrow at the end of the cover. Love it. Uh, just to stop those birds from running uh and it works surprisingly well you know you know those are all kind of old timer tales you know the guy who leaves his truck radio on or something like that but but i'm intrigued by the the blocker that hides until uh, everybody's closer what why hide him at that point well if he stands out where the birds can see him yeah uh you know the hunters will be coming up the draw they'll be two three hundred yards away Birds will see him. Uh, uh, they'll run back down and, and take off out of range. Okay. Uh, that's why you hide. Uh, if you're hidden, you, you'll have those pheasants run right up within 10 feet of you. 
Okay. So, yeah. But if you're standing out where they can easily see you, they, they will not come within gun range. Well, they'll squirt out to one side or the other too, won't they? Right. Yeah. They will. Yeah. I've seen them, you know, halfway through going over the ridge, over that saddle into the next uh, draw. Uh, yes. And then, uh, you know, the, the properties I hunt, uh, a lot of times I'm hunting the same birds on successive days. Sure. Every time I hunt an area, I come in at a different angle. Uh, ha, ha, ha. You know, because yeah. they're going to do whatever they did the day before that worked mm-hmm. for them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, boy, that's a great point. And, you know, that, that also holds true for any place where anybody else is hunting, whether it's block management or any other kind of public access or walk-in. You know, everybody parks in the same place. Everybody, I mean, you can look at the path. It, the the yeah. reason it's called a well-beaten path is because everybody goes there. Why not go yeah. the other way instead? Yeah, I use it fishing, too. You know, everybody's yeah. floating down the good-looking bank. I yeah. go to the other side. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I always have fun going in right beh- right behind those guys because most of the time they skipped over all the good spots. Right. Um, let's, um, by the way, that's Al Gadori, 6xoutfitters.com is where you learn more about Al's hunting and fishing exploits and what you might be able to do to take advantage of his experience and expertise. I'm Scott Linden. This is the Upland Nation podcast. All right, we got a dog on point. We're shutting up, but we did not stop to admire the point and show it to everybody on camera, like I always am guilty of doing. Um, we're walking up. How do we walk up? What kind of an attitude, and where do we go when we're walking up? Well, you never know how close you're going to be able to get. Yeah. The one thing you don't do is come up behind the dog. Yeah. Uh, you've, you've got to loop around and get that pheasant between you and the dog. Mm-hmm. Uh, an experienced uh, pointing dog, this, this can take years before they figure this out, will loop around and block a running pheasant. And uh, that that helps a lot. Uh, some dogs learn how to do this, some never get it. But uh, you should be able to, to do it. Yeah. So, so we see the dog hit the point. So the first thing we do is turn and swing. Uh, what would we call that? Anyway, we go way out and try and come back in. But, you know, sometimes we can't get that that close. Or no, that... I, and I'm looping around, uh, you know, 7,500 yards ahead of the dog. Oh, wow. Because that, that says it's going to move. Yeah, uh, yeah. And then come in, and the dog may move two or three times and point with yeah. pheasants. Cause, yeah. uh, they seldom just just sit there like sharp tails and huns do. Yeah. Are you, are you uh, uh, giving a command for that or a release, or are you just crossing your fingers and hope the dog has figured these things out? No, I don't say a word to the dog because yeah. I don't want that bird to know where I am. Yeah. I'm trying to yeah. be quiet, yeah. you know, as quiet as I can, you know, walking through cover. <laughs> Uh, but no, the dog doesn't need any instruction. He's he's going to move if the bird moves. Yeah, I, I don't I don't yell whoa. Uh, I just assume if he's moving, the bird's moving. Yeah, uh, you know, trust your dog and let him hunt. Yeah, I remember years ago a a, a great uh, uh, drawtar trainer in South Dakota reminded me that the dog, the smart dog knows his job is to put birds in the air for the gun. Let him figure out how to do that. Yeah. Um. So here we are. We think we're be- we think the birds between us and the pointing dog. Um, at some point, we got to move in and fly that bird. Uh, things like foot position, ready position on the gun. Uh, you know uh, how we approach. We know the dog's straight. Let's just say straight in front of us, between us. We're, we're nose to nose, but we're fifty yards away from each other. Can we figure out which way the bird's going to fly? If you know the area, yes, uh, they will fly towards cover. Yeah. Uh, you know, most of the time, not always. Uh, if you're in a big area, big open area, well, you don't know which way they're going to go. There's usually two people involved. Yes. And, uh, you know, while you're walking in, I'm always thinking, uh, like I do during a field trial, where my shot's going to be. Yeah, you know, I've I've got that left side or I've got that right side, and and if the bird goes right, I'm I'm not going to shoot. Yeah, it's that's the other guy's birds. So the decision is already made uh, bef- before that gets up. And of course, the the muzzle of the gun is up, 
uh, I like to keep the, the stock under my arm. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think about footwork too. If, uh, if my shot's going to be going, uh, you know, to the left, I want to get that right foot forward before I mount the gun. Yeah. Now, uh, all of a sudden, it sounds counterintuitive, but what you're really meaning is you want to square off to the direction the bird's going to go. You get your right foot forward, you're a right-hand shooter. Right. So so that you're you're angled better for a right-to-left shot. Yes. Okay, so I understood that correctly. Yeah, yeah because you can, you can get a smoother swing that way. Yeah. Uh, you try going the other way, uh, pretty soon you swing the gun, and it you run out of room it starts to go down you shoot under the bird yeah i heard uh, I, I read somebody finally described that as a rainbow arc you know yes and that's, a, that's exactly that what it is really drove home the point for me yeah if you if you reach the the end of your swing your hips can't bend anymore to the left your gun just naturally drops yes and it's more important as you get older uh, <laughs> we, don't, we don't get more flexible um, and, oh, I'm glad you alerted me to that. Thank you very yes. much. Yeah, I'll watch for that as I get older, if I survive this summer and all the honeydew projects. <clears throat> yes, well, I, I just had a checkup, and, uh, you know, I get the big printout at the end of it, and one section said risk factors. <laughs> the only thing under it was elderly elderly <laughs> you might hear that dear listeners and think well what do you mean al will walk your ass off <laughs> i i forgot who did it i think tad one of our cameramen one day we got back to the truck and he said we walked 12 miles today <laughs> and that's probably not the longest walk you've taken people on is it no uh usually it's five to eight uh miles um, you know, de depending on the terrain, yeah. uh, a lot of times I'll just cut it off at ten miles and say, you know, this is this is enough for one day. Yeah, yeah. You don't uh, want you don't want somebody so sore they can't show up again the next morning, do you? Well, especially if it's me. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I I don't have the nerve because it would be admitting too much. But someday I'll write the story on. Here's what you do for leg cramps. Here's what you do for a sore lower back, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But in, in the meanwhile, uh, we're going to talk more pheasant hunting. And, and I, I want to I just ask you, Al, you know, you're out there um, helping other people succeed at pheasant hunting quite often. What are the things that, uh, that, that we do right and wrong when we're pheasant hunting that you would like to fix? Here's your chance to get it off your chest. Don't use anybody's real name, but go ahead. Tell me the bad examples and the good examples. Well, the, the biggest uh, mistake most people make is having a gun that's choked too tight. Mm -hmm. uh, improved cylinder is the best all-round choke. Uh, modified is not a good choice. Full is even worse. Uh, that being said, all my guns are choked, improved cylinder, and full. Yeah, but you're not us, and, and I alluded to your uh, Spaniel trial gunning experience, and we'll get back to that in a moment. Well, is that because you're always using those beautiful, older, classic guns, and they came that way, or do you do that on purpose? Well, they, they do come that way, and, uh, you know, a classic gun, you don't ever want to modify it. Yeah. Uh, but I think most people would be better off with improved cylinder in both barrels. Yeah. In, yeah. Unless you're a disciplined shooter and you practice a lot, and you know you know what your gun can do with a with a full choke, uh, but I'm talking about the shooter that you know hits about fifty percent of his targets on wild birds, and also when he misses, he knows exactly what he did wrong. Uh, but improved cylinder will just get you out of trouble most of the time. Yeah, uh, you know, you don't get that many good opportunities beyond thirty five yards. No, if you do, I pay. I take a pass. I mean, you don't, and I've seen that. Uh, but most people probably shouldn't anyway. But uh, well, good it depends point. on the angle. If, uh -huh. if you can't, yeah. if you can't see a pheasant's head, you should not shoot at it because uh, you are not going to kill him. Uh, you know, beyond twenty yards. That might be the the lesson of the day, Al Gadori. Thank you for that. I'm going to write it down. If you can't see the 
pheasant's head beyond 20 yards, do not shoot. Yeah, it's, it's so true. I mean, just think about the ballistics, if nothing else. Yeah, you'll knock them down if you break a wing, but yeah. that's pretty hard to do. That's not much to shoot at. That, yeah. that skinny little wing bone sticking out there. Yeah, so you know the the, the odds are way against you. Absolutely. And if you wait, you usually get a shot. You that bird will turn. Yeah. I I think you were far away, but I got to tell this one. It was a sharp tail story, but it was with you, and we were out in um, some place other than Lewistown. Where where were we anyway? That whole covey got up over where you guys were. But me and Lynn, Lynn's carrying the camera. I get to carry a shotgun. It's my TV show. And and the covey gets up, and they all go that way, except one goes that way and then turns right towards us. Lynn's rolling. I turn to the camera. I say, watch this. It's like a passing. It's like a driven pheasant shot, and it dropped right at his feet. But that doesn't happen very often. But you're saying it does happen with ringnecks. Yeah, they uh, they don't always fly in a straight line. Yeah. I, I never thought about that, I guess. So we should be patient. Yes, up to a point. <laughs> Unless we got, we got if you can. the second barrel is choked full, <laughs> then we can wait a long time. <laughs> yeah. What about the uh, the things we do right? Is there anything that you would encourage? Maybe we don't do it, but we should. What would you encourage uh, folks who don't hunt as much as you do or I do? I'm lucky enough to. Uh, to what should we do more of? Well, just what I mentioned before, the biggest mistake people make is that they make too much noise. Yeah. You don't need to talk. Yeah. Uh, carry water. Yeah. Very important. Keep drinking water all day. Uh, have water for your dog. Yeah. Uh, you know, have have the gun that you're familiar with. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've asked people what their chokes are, and they they didn't know. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. they had screw in chokes. They didn't know what the code was. They assumed that I would know all these things. <laughs> well, I don't. <laughs> yeah. Hey, by the way, if you want to know, go to truelockchokes.com. <laughs> they they uh-huh. got they got the chart, but um. <clears throat> Yeah, and you know, uh, and a lot of people have seen this, and and I'm a believer now. Uh, you don't just give your dog a drink of water. You've got a special application device for some sort of dog cooling. Yes, I carry a spray bottle, and with the setters in particular, uh, just spraying them seems to help them more than uh, than giving them a drink. Yeah, uh, a friend of mine showed showed me a. a interesting method of giving a dog a drink the other day that it was so simple i i just couldn't believe i never thought of it he carried a a gallon ziploc bag with him and he would pour the water in the bag and then open it and let the dog drink out of it and usually he had a pretty good idea how much the dog would drink so there'd be no waste and it was just a very lightweight uh cheap you know way to uh give your dog a drink yeah. i tried it with i tried it with bigfoot yeah. And uh, she just stuck her head right down through the bottom of the bag. <laughs> and uh, it didn't work out with that dog, but Ooh. with his dog, it, it worked just fine. Where's a camera when you need one? That would have been hilarious. Yeah. Yeah, yeah with your spray, uh, what, what are you spraying? Oh, just water. No, I mean, on, on what part of your dog? Oh, oh uh, inside of the ears. Yeah. Uh, yeah. really all over the dog, but mostly around the head. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you can lay them down, spray their stomach. Yeah. That, that, that helps cool them. Yeah. Uh, you know, they, they really learn to like that. They'll come over when they're, you know, they need a spray. Uh, I, but I, I think that helps them more than any, anything else you could do. You know, I, I love that idea. And here's what I've learned. Uh, it's true with any spray, even the little pumpy ones that we use, but uh, aerosol spray in particular. Dogs got to get trained to understand that it's not a snake. Yeah. They hear that sound and, and their immediate reaction is defensive. So, you know, you know don't, exp- unless your dog is so hot, but, uh, you know, train, train that a little bit. Just to help it, help your dog learn that it's, like you said, Al, it's a, it's a great experience. Feels good. Yeah. The first time they're exposed, uh, you know, they may 
they may not like it, <laughs> uh, but they, they learn to appreciate it after a while. Yeah. All right. Let's, uh, I promise to talk just mo- momentarily about this, you know, uh, b- even before you and I worked together, um, people said, oh, that guy, he, he guns at a lot of spaniel trials. And I, I don't know if you're doing that anymore, but you know, that, that immediately raised you a couple more notches on, on the, on, on my, uh, is that the puppy? <laughs> Or, yeah. Uh, or, or or you're having tea. Uh, anyway, what what is it about spaniel trials and gunning and, and what you know? Most spaniel trials are pretty high stress. You go out there and you're and you're shooting birds for these guys who are already stressed out. Well, tell us a little bit about that experience. Well, it's it's nerve wracking. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the handlers expect you to kill every bird you shoot at. And, and at uh, 35 yards, please. Well, they don't want an easy retrieve. They yeah. want a long, difficult retrieve. Yeah. And, you know, you've got two dogs working. You've got judges um, behind the handler. You've got three gunners out there. Uh, you have an area where you can shoot. If you're the center gun, well, you're you're kind of limited to birds that are straight away. Uh and if you're on the wings, on the sides, uh, you know, you're on the right, you got the birds that go to the right. Uh, and you want to let them get out there as, as far as uh, is reasonable. You, yeah. don't, you don't take easy shots. And you also do not want to drop a bird on the dog's head. <laughs> uh, you know, if you, you drop a bird close to the dog, uh, it encourages the dog to break. Uh, you know, all those spaniels are are steady to wing and shot or, or should be, you know, you know, that they're trained to be steady to wing and shot, but it's, it's not for everybody. It's not hunting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's a high stress situation and, and you've, you've got to be on your toes because uh, you know, the, it's a moving operation. Everybody's walking. Uh, you're constantly looking to see if, someone's out in front of you that shouldn't be there because you've got bird planters out in front of you planting those birds yeah and, and uh, you, got, you have to keep track of them uh, do you have a gallery behind you too do they let, let a gallery oh, follow sometimes on? sometimes yeah. you'll have 40 or 50 people following yeah, yeah so you get an and audience every, too and they're and they're all better shooters than you when they're in the gallery oh they're all perfect shots they yeah, uh yeah. Have, you know when i'm in the gallery every time i see somebody miss i'm thinking boy that that looked pretty easy. I wouldn't miss that. No. <laughs> oh my! Um, are there any transferences from from that kind of experience to the bird field, to real hunting, if you will? Uh, when it, whether it's a, a shooting tip or just a, you know perspective. Well, you, you learn what's possible because uh, you're shooting a lot of birds at extreme ranges. Yeah. But but these are you know tame birds. Uh, they're easier to kill than a wild bird. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you learn how how important uh, positioning your feet is. Huh. Um, and, you know, you get a lot of practice shooting doing that. Uh, it helps. Yeah. Well, there you go. So, you know, uh, something for everybody there. Um, we've talked about water. We've talked about all those other things. Is there anything else that you carry in your vest that I've forgotten you carried that we should carry that we probably don't? You need a brush to get the burrs off your dog. Yeah. Uh, yes. You know, there's a lot of burrs in Montana. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I've, I've had dogs come out of Crick Bottom sometime. They had so many cockle burrs on them, I didn't recognize what kind of animal they were. You know, the, <laughs> the white dog turned brown all of a sudden. Yeah. 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 And, and, abs- and, and not just there. I remember the same thing. We had so many burrs on my wire hair's ears. They flipped forward once and adhered to his eyelids and his eyebrows and he was effectively blindfolded yeah yeah it can, it can happen yeah huh. yeah well you that, know spray spraying your dog with shoshin yeah uh you know helps yeah get the burrs out you know before you hunt mm. uh you know that can help a little bit oh i've never heard about it as a preventive yeah and and also uh you know when it's cool enough uh, having a vest on the dog, you know, just less area for the birds to to stick to. Yeah. And and pheasant hunting, uh, a protective vest helps a lot because 
we get a lot of barbed wire cuts. Yeah, we do. And, and, <laughs> and it's, it's usually from chasing a wounded pheasant. Uh, uh, this last year I had a, a vest made. Uh, it was cloth and then coated with uh, plastic coated leather. Oh my God. And, uh, you know, it's like a, a vest that the, the hog dogs wear yeah, when they're yeah. hog hunting. Yeah. Uh, and I, I put that on the labs in the late season. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if it's, you know, 60 degrees, the thing's just too warm. They can't hunt in that thing. But I, I like to have something on them. Uh, neoprene breast helps a lot, too, with the setters uh, when it's sure. cool enough to use that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, there you have it. We could go on all day, but the next time we converse, it will be over dinner and drinks somewhere in downtown Lewistown, Algadori, 6xoutfitters.com. Learn more about Al and all of his exploits. And then if you want to see him in action, go to the, uh, let's see, what is my YouTube channel? Scott Linden Outdoors, I think. Go there and watch some of the episodes that we've put up that uh, that we shot out there in various lo locations in Montana. Al, I learn something every time I pick up the phone and talk with you. Thanks so much for being a part of the Upland Nation podcast. Have a great season. All right. Same to you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Don't you go away. We're covering still a little bit more ground here. I'm going to help you find sharp tails no matter where you're going. I'm going to give you some jumping off points, if nothing else. Right after this word from PointerShotguns.com. Yeah, just shot another video for them. I used uh, one of their Cerakoted over and under guns in 12 gauge, one of the Acreous guns. And then I also shot one of those case colored side by sides, also in 12 gauge. But the best news is there is now, and you better hurry, they're going, and I literally, I've seen the inventory numbers. They're going fast. They got a 28 gauge case colored over and under if you're looking for a small gauge gun at an affordable price where the fit and finish look good and you will be the hit in the field and at the range when you show up with one of those but they have them in 12 gauge 20 gauge now 28 gauge and that also goes for the side by sides no 28s yet but they have them in 12 and 20 also nickel plated receivers and traditional bluing. Learn more about all the models at pointershotguns.com. Find a nearby retailer. Watch some of my videos while you're there. Appreciate that. Pointershotguns.com. And clean those guns with sageandbreaker.com. They have everything you need to clean your gun, including some new bore solvent. So after a long day at the range, get all that gunk out. Also, their CLP is my go-to cleaning, lubricating, and protecting spray-on right after a day in the field. Sign up for their mailing list at sageandbreaker.com. You won't miss out on future sales and new products, including, yeah, it's coming, all you rifle hunters. They've got a new scoped gun case, so get on the mailing list and you'll get first crack at that as well. Sageandbreaker.com. Well, if you haven't noticed, I've got sharp tails on my mind these days. That's how I'm starting the season. Some of you might be doing a dove hunt or a forest grouse hunt, but for me, it's sharpies. And while I love Montana, there are sharp tails in all sorts of other places, and maybe you are headed for them. You can find huntable populations in the Dakotas, Wyoming, Nebraska, Montana, Alaska, and even Idaho. So if it's time for your road trip for sharp tails, here are some places where you might consider starting. Well, I've talked about the eastern half of Montana a lot, and there's lots of great block management country out there that you can access. South Dakota, west of the Missouri River. I love that country. That includes, uh, say, the Fort Pier National Grasslands, among other places. There's lots of, um, yeah, I, I don't know what to call it, except other federal agency administered land that if you poke around, you might find, uh, especially right along the river there. So take out a map and look at all of that. In North Dakota, 
I like the Missouri Slope region. In Nebraska, Sand Hills, hand down. Hands down, it's the Sand Hills for me. I love Valentine. Great country out there. Check it out, Nebraska's Sand Hills. And then in Wyoming, the eastern slopes of the Bighorn Mountains and the Laramie Range are where you're going to find huntable populations of sharp-tailed grouse. There's your road trip suggestion for this week on the Upland Nation podcast. Brought to you in part by TrueLockChokes.com. They have choke tubes for just about everything. If you're a dove hunter because there's nothing else to shoot at yet, well, they've refined their dove chokes to make your cheap ammo perform like good ammo. Yeah, slightly tightening the exit diameter improves the pattern density on those seven and a halfs and eights that you buy on sale or that you buy as, quote, dove loads. Learn more about all of their choke tubes from 28 on up at truelockchokes.com, T-R-U-L-O-C-K, chokes.com. It's time to welcome our newest sponsor, landtrust.com. Yeah, they named it that for a reason. Landtrust.com connects trusted guests like you with landowners who offer exclusive access to their land for bird hunting. It's exclusive, it's private property, and it's affordable. Take a look at their website and see for yourself, landtrust.com. It's a DIY option that focuses on providing you and your dogs with a safe, quality experience. Yeah, go to landtrust.com, create your account, and learn more. Believe me, your dogs will thank you for it. Landtrust.com And with that, I want to thank Al Godori at 6xoutfitters.com again for enlightening us. Lots of great nuggets in there. Go back and listen to this again because I'll tell you, you'll pick up something the second time that you didn't have the first time. Thank you all if you've left a comment, a review, or a rating. And thank you, sponsors. Sageandbreaker.com, PointerShotguns.com, ProPlansport.com, MidValleyClays.com, TrueLockChokes.com. If you want more of this kind of information every day, go to FindBirdHuntingSpots.com. And while you're there, take a look at all of the public access tutorials webinars, and even an e-booklet. It's all at FindBirdHuntingSpots.com. I'm Scott Linden. This is the Upland Nation Podcast. Thank you for listening.